Daily Detroit is brought to you by the community. Support our work at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. Hello and welcome to your Daily Detroit for Monday, November 9th, 2020. I'm Jer Stays. Today's show is about one thing and one thing only. Despite the crazy week that we just had, despite all the things in the news, there is one story that continues, and that is of the coronavirus pandemic. And Michigan is experiencing rising cases with nearly 14,000 confirmed cases and almost 130 deaths since Friday. It's important we talk about it to get an idea of where we're at and what's next. Dr. Paul Thomas from Plum Health Direct Primary Care joins us. Let's just jump right into that conversation. Dr. Paul, welcome back to Daily Detroit, sir. Hey, it's great to be here, man. Glad we can catch up on this important topic. And it's important, too, as we have crossed 200,000 cases in Michigan, and they are racking up quickly. On Saturday, it was more than 6,200 cases. Deaths are starting to increase slightly. Really concerning hospitalizations are increasing. What are you seeing out there? Yeah, I'm seeing that. People thought that this pandemic had passed us by, and I think we've become a little bit more lax with how we're gathering with people and going out to restaurants and social gatherings. And we're realizing now that just about everyone we know, uh, somebody has somebody that they know who has coronavirus. So I think what we need to do as as a people is understand that just about anyone you know could have coronavirus, and that's the assumption that you have to operate under until we're through this pandemic. And to look at the -the on-the-ground reality is that there are reports now that the state is considering re-engaging the field hospitals in Novi and Detroit. The mayor of Rochester Hills has it. He apparently is doing well so far, although fatigued. Uh, The Warren City Hall in Macomb County is closed due to COVID. Uh, Although not in Detroit, Detroit native Ben Carson in the White House administration has come down with it. Like It's something where it just keeps adding on, and I don't know exactly how to get it to relate to people. I know that there is increased spread when you're inside. We've talked about these things a thousand times. I know. It's like, who else needs to become infected for you to realize that this is going to affect everyone if you're not careful? Like the president's gotten it. Key uh, members of the administration have gotten it. Celebrities have had it and talked about it. And, you know, locally, you know, these city governments are closing because of it. You know, Warren City Hall, like you mentioned, the mayor in Rochester Hills, like it can affect you, it can affect your family, and it can have a disastrous outcome. And the scary thing is, we don't know what the outcome is going to be for you when you get it, because there just isn't enough research. And we don't know if there's going to be long-term comorbidities, that means diseases that you have for life because of this, or maybe for a year or two years, we just don't know. And so it's so important to take this seriously every day, mask up and protect yourself. One of the things a number of listeners talked to me about since the last time we chatted, Doc, was that anecdotally, more people who are working in bars and restaurants seem to be getting sick. There was reports around Hopcat. A number of local bars have had issues with that. Multiple bartenders going down with it. What is it that you're seeing? Are you seeing this or is this something that's just more visible because places are sharing it? What are you seeing? I think when you go to a bar and restaurant, they have to report now that they're taking down people's names and phone numbers. And so, uh, and some bars are going public just saying, hey, we have had a few cases, therefore we're closing for a week. So we're definitely hearing more about it, but also bars and restaurants are the best places to catch coronavirus. There's a nice graph online that I can send over to you, but it, it lists the top ways to get coronavirus and they are going to a bar, attending a religious service with 500 or more worshipers, going to a sports stadium, and attending a large music concert. So those are your top ways to get it. And like a medium risk activity would be like going to the beach or shopping at the mall. And a low risk activity would be, you know, going to the gas station or playing tennis or going camping. When you think about the activity, you have to also think about the risk involved. And of course, if you work at a bar or restaurant, you're going to be one of the highest risk people in the community because you're going to be in a kind of an enclosed space with a lot of people from the public who you may not know if they've been tested or actively have the virus, and that's problematic. What are the health risks with going to an indoor restaurant when it's empty? That's another question I get a lot of, is, well, if there's only a couple of people in there, 
you know, I still want to go. Like, there seems to be this pushback that I still want to do all the things that I did. I did a little bit of research, but can you kind of enlighten here that indoor, even if it doesn't feel like it's packed to the gills? Sure. I mean, it's still a small enclosed space, as many bars and restaurants are. And then you're getting, you know, you have to think about all the people who are working there, the bartenders, the servers, the kitchen crew. You know, that might be 12, 15, 20 people. And then you and the other guests there. So that's already a pretty high density of people. And it's really hard to guarantee that all of those people are free of coronavirus at the time you're dining. And a lot of people don't know that they're infected. Again, I'm going to reiterate this. The incubation period or the time between when you get the virus and when you have symptoms can be up to 12 days. Usually it's five to seven days, but people could be going out in the community not knowing that they actively have the coronavirus and spreading it to several other people before they realize they have symptoms and then they get tested and then it's too late, as they say. It's already spread to dozens of people. That asymptomatic transmission piece is just so hard for a number of people to understand because they're so used to, okay, I'm coughing, I don't feel well, I'm sick. But the idea that you could be sick at any time and not know it, it just blows people's minds. We had a thread about it on a couple of our social media platforms. It just didn't register with folks that even getting the idea of we're getting into that fake news crap again about like, well, you know, if I don't feel sick, how can I be sick? But that just isn't medically correct. You're absolutely right. And it's really difficult for people to understand. And some people are like, well, I don't have symptoms, so I'm going to continue doing what I normally do. Even though I have the virus, I just don't have symptoms, so therefore I can't spread it. And that's absolutely false. You know, there's nothing worse than you could do than continue to go about your business. If you've been exposed or if you've tested positive, you need to quarantine for seven days to 14 days until you stop shedding the virus. People can shed the virus for up to 30 days, which is another doozy. And so you can be spreading the virus for a month after you've been exposed. This is really what makes this virus so difficult to get a handle on because the asymptomatic spread among young, healthy people is what is fueling this virus. And then on top of that, we just had an election where millions of people went out to vote And now millions of people are gathering in the streets to celebrate. And both of those things could have been avoided. We could have had a robust plan to have everybody vote by mail or everybody vote by dropping off an absentee ballot. But instead, we went ahead and had everybody go to the polls. And it put a whole host of people at risk to the coronavirus, young and elderly alike. And our poll workers, the election workers, are the real heroes in all of this because they knew the risks that they were putting themselves into, and uh, they did it anyways, and they you know, served our democracy in this way. It's something that not a lot of people are talking about, but it's something we should be talking about, is how we're going to have a huge spike of infections after the, the election, and we're already seeing that because we just had millions of people gather in one space to vote. Yeah, I know of at least one city clerk that has come down with uh, coronavirus. I think about those poll workers as well when I think about these extended counting and tabulation periods, because even though it's a bigger space at a place like Cobo, and even though the city of Detroit did require testing for these poll workers, they did a good job in in putting that. We know that testing alone is not a mitigation strategy. And yes, they required masks and things like that. But you just had so many people in the same kind of space that it makes me definitely worry about poll workers and also value their contributions. Yeah. And I think we did, as a society, the best we could do under the circumstances, you know, uh, reacting to this as in testing folks, having people mask up, renting out larger spaces like the TCF Center and counting ballots there. But there's a huge risk to voting this year, and it could have been carried out in a more humane way by our federal government. It could have been absentee only or mail-in vote only to kind of prevent a large outbreak like we're seeing right now. So there is no lockdown in sight, even though that cases are, I mean, we're in a situation where we're worse than the first wave, correct? Oh, we are way worse. If you look at the numbers, it, oh man, if you go to the michigan.gov slash coronavirus page, and then you click on uh, cumulative data, and then click on daily cases, our current outbreak right now is dwarfing what was happening in late March, early April. That was that original spike back in late March, early April, where you having like 1,500 new cases a day and we were like freaking out, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, last week 
we had 5,500 new cases announced in one day. That's more than triple. That's almost quadruple the case count as in late March, early April. And so these are insane numbers. And it's scary, it's concerning, and we need to have a coordinated federal response to help us get this under control. And we're going to get into the idea of what a future federal response might look like. But I want to get also through another listener point. One of the things is our listeners listen to podcasts. I listen to podcasts. And I've had the same experience, too. There are now ads and things for masks that are purporting to be stronger or better or more sealed, all those other things. Uh, Like there's one in particular that I know is on a popular coronavirus talking podcast with Andy Slavitt, which is called the Live-In Guard Mask. There's other types. But what is your thought about the idea of upping our mask game a little bit right now? Sure. I think it's a great idea to purchase a mask that's going to give you great protection. And you don't need to buy it. You could even make it at home. But having three layers of fabric has been recommended as a good uh, way to prevent the spread of virus. So I looked at that Live and Guard mask, and it looks like their most protective one is is just three layers of cotton, basically. Mm. And then they have two layers for their active one if you're working out. It's probably a little bit easier to breathe than the two-ply mask. But you don't need to necessarily buy one like that. You can make one at home or buy a different brand. We found that those little, um, it's kind of like that sleeve that's kind of like a turtleneck that you can pull up over your face. The gator. That isn't as effective because the material is thin. So what they, they say is if you hold up your mask to the light and if you can easily see through it, it's not a good mask. If you hold it up to the light and it completely blocks out the light that comes through, that's trying to come through, that's a better mask. And then of course, Surgical masks are available now. They're, you can buy them at the store. I, I saw some at like Home Depot the other day. Um, there's also N95 masks that are available. You know, those sort of masks that were really hard to get in March and April, the production cycle in manufacturing has made more of those available. So you could get one of those as well. Like at our office, one of our doctors wears an N95 with a fabric mask over top of it. You know, it's like double coverage or whatever, but it's something that, shouldn't be terribly expensive. You can get a good mask for $15, $20. You can get a box of N95s for, you know, usually they're like a dollar a mask or something like that. So um, when you are going out to the grocery store, mask up and protect other people and protect yourself. I think about the kinds of situations I'm in. I've actually got multiple masks and I think about, well, if I'm just going to go out and walk the dog by myself and I'm not near people, it's a completely different situation than when it's like, oh, there's some errand that I have to do that I have to be near people. But yeah, it's important, I think. And especially now that it's kind of dragged on, I think it might be time for people to kind of refresh their masks, even if you're going to make it yourself, which I think is a great option and something that you can do. And I think it's also interesting that you noted the gator, it's not really about the design. It's about the quality of the cloth itself. Yeah, and and the thickness and the more layers you have, the better, essentially. I think three layers is Ideal, two layers is good. So let's start going into the bigger response thing. Obviously, there was just an election. I don't know if you heard, Doc. I did. I was uh, alerted to the fact that we have a new president-elect coming into office. And hopefully, well, we'll talk about the plan here shortly. Yeah, I think the first thing to start with is kind of layers national and statewide is that our test percentages are really, really bad to know how bad this virus is actually spreading right now. The data that I am seeing now is but we have about 10% of the tests we need. And then Harvard Global Health estimates a need for 14 million tests in the U.S. U.S. daily tests have yet to exceed 1.5 million, so about 10% of the tests we need. That case is also similar in Michigan and similar across the country. How important is this testing piece and where are we at? I read through the Biden pandemic plan, and I think there's a lot of good points in there. So let's start with that. Just recognizing that we all have a role to play in slowing the spread of the virus and acknowledging that mask wearing could save more than 100,000 lives. If we all wear masks, we could save 100,000 Americans from the coronavirus. And then ramping up testing is extremely important. It, It really comes down to correctly identifying who has the virus and then doing contact tracing and getting that person who has tested positive to quarantine and stay at home for seven to 14 days until they're much less infective for the community. And testing is essential because 
If you don't have a good test, if you don't have enough tests, you'll never be able to identify who has the virus and you won't be able to stop the spread of the virus. What are other things in the plan that from a medical perspective that you found important to talk about? Well, I think they're treating this almost like a public works sort of thing where you need to hire and mobilize you know, thousands upon thousands, maybe even 100,000 workers to do contact tracing and follow the virus and prevent its spread. And so I think that was a really strong point. And then helping people get access to healthcare through insurance is a good way to do it. I mean, I'm a fan of the direct primary care. That's why I do the direct primary care model. But um, acknowledging that people are going to need healthcare coverage and health insurance coverage to cover the cost of getting sick. And the more people who have coverage, the less medical bankruptcies our fellow Americans will encounter. So I think it's great to have an acknowledgement of that. And um, making sure that we lay the groundwork for distributing this vaccine. You know, Pfizer just announced that they are on track to produce a vaccine that's going to be 90% effective, which is amazing. But that's not going to be helpful if we don't have the infrastructure to produce and distribute that vaccine across the country and perhaps even across the world. And so doubling down on building that infrastructure is going to be really important uh, for us as a nation so we can uh, prevent the spread by getting to herd immunity through the vaccine. And you made a mention to me as we were getting prepped for this thing that the people involved are folks that you feel pretty good about. Oh, definitely. We need to have reputable scientists, epidemiologists, physicians who have experience in taking on other pandemics, who've had success, who've had experience working with the federal government in pandemic responses, and who are really the thought leaders in the medical community. Because as a nation, uh, the federal government is going to have to earn back the trust of Americans in terms of uh, getting them to take this vaccine. And so one way to do that is to earn the trust of physicians who in turn have the trust of you know their panel of patients or their community and producing a vaccine that's going to be an excellent vaccine. So, you know, I liked looking at this list. I, I think there are a lot of great names on here. Probably the one people are most familiar with is uh, Dr. Murthy uh, because he was a former Surgeon General. And then he also worked on the Ebola and Zika virus pandemics and outbreaks. And so he has experience there. And then a uh, doctor who's also an author is Dr. Atul Gawande. He wrote uh, a few amazing books just about how the healthcare system works and our role as physicians in that system. And so it's really nice to have these smart, thoughtful, engaging physicians working as members of this advisory board and as co-chairs. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they produce and, and how it can help our country in this time. And to kind of wrap up here, I do want to talk about that vaccine candidate that seems to be doing really well, and that's really exciting news. But there's a couple things about this. Number one, it requires a lot of refrigeration uh, to be delivered. And number two, it's going to take some time. Do you have any idea on that? Because I think people think there's a vaccine and the heavens will open. It's kind of the beginning of the clouds parting. And I think especially for the business owners out there, the people who are working out there, anyone who is trying to figure out what's happening over time, just because this vaccine gets approved, it does not mean the next day everything's better. Do you have any idea on that timeline? I think they had said that they would try to get 50 million doses out by the first half of uh, 2021 and then producing more vaccines after that. I didn't really have a chance to read up too much on that that distribution, so you're going to have to check me on this one. But uh, on, on the drive-in, I heard a story about it. And I think they were saying they were trying to get... Um, 50 million doses out there in the next few months and then more beyond that time frame. So it's not going to cover everyone immediately because we have 380 million people in the United States. And this vaccine takes two doses. Yeah. So you, you got a half that number. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it's going to cover 25 million people with those 50 million doses. Yeah, here it is. Pfizer has estimated that 50 million doses of its two-shot vaccine could be available globally by the end of 2020 which could cover 25 million people. So that's pretty vague. And I think that's going to be like an ambitious thing. Like when a general contractor tells you it's going to take you 90 days to remodel the bathroom, you all know <laughs> what that means. Um, <laughs> similar here. I mean, Pfizer is competing with other companies 
for governments and health insurance companies and hospitals to buy their vaccine. So this may be an oversell and an overpromise. And, you know, you have to be patient and wait to see what happens because in reality, I think it's going to take much longer than that. And so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Well, Dr. Paul Thomas, Plum Health Direct Primary Care, I thank you so much for your time today. And I know we'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks so much for having me on, Jer. And stay safe out there, everybody. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Your Daily Detroit. Coming up, we've got some great talks with Steve Freeze, Newsweek and Our Detroit, kind of unpacking where we're at so far with the post-election craziness. Fletcher Sharp talks sports. I talked to the executive director of City Year Detroit on their new headquarters in Detroit's Milwaukee Junction. And of course, a whole lot more. But with everything going on, I want to make sure to get this in your feeds. If you want to support what we're doing, you can make that happen at dailydetroit.com slash support. There's a variety of options, a variety of things you can do. It really helps what we're doing. And if you don't have financial resources, consider sharing the show. It's a great way to help push Detroit's conversation forward. With that, I'm Jer Stays. Thank you so much for listening to your Daily Detroit. Take care of each other, and we'll get through this together. <laughs>